Well, we've been in this sermon series called People Jesus Met, and uh, this is part six. So we've had the privilege of just journeying with these different encounters, and I don't know about you, but as, as we've just seen Christ and just his, his unique nature as he sort of applies who he is to different people, it's just been wonderful to see. Now, a guy by the name of William Vanstone writes, and I think it's almost a, a summary, perhaps, of the series, although we've still got one week to go next, next week, but uh, Vanstone writes, as Jesus moves about, he leaves behind him a trail of transformed scenes and changed situations. Fishermen no longer at their nets, sick people restored to health, critics confounded, a storm stilled, hunger assuaged, a dead girl raised to life. Jesus' presence is an active and instantly transforming presence. He's never the mere observer of the scene or the one who waits upon events, but always the transformer of the scene and the initiator of events. And that's beautiful to see that even as we see Christ today on the cross, he's not this victim. In fact, he says, I willingly lay down my life. So he's actually the one working behind the scenes to transform lives. And so if you'll journey with me today, you will see Christ stripped of all of his garments, hanging naked upon a cross. And if you know anything about Roman culture, you'll know that the cross was the horror of horrors. So abhorrent and so abominable was the cross that a Roman citizen would never be crucified on the cross. It was reserved for non-Roman citizens, so scandalous, and the Romans often didn't even mention the word. It was used for serious enemies of the state. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear the mocking crowd. If you watch carefully, you'll see Christ dying in agony. And yet in his dying moments, he's still on mission. That's what's so beautiful about Christ. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm sure when, when we come to that place of, of agony and death for ourselves, uh, it's a moment where, where all our senses are focused internally as we're fighting for life, so to speak. And yes, that was true of Christ, but, but somehow his love transcended that and he was still on mission even in his dying moments. And he accomplishes one final deed of amazing grace on the cross. So what's some of the background that's led him to even be on this cross? And here's just one aspect I wanna highlight before we turn to our text for this morning. There's been a fiasco of trials. Pontius Pilate has condemned Jesus to die on a cross. But Pilate didn't really want to do that in some ways. He was kinda torn and, and, and Pilate's plan to release Jesus has backfired. Mark tells us in his gospel, in chapter 15, that a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. So we've got this guy, Barabbas. He's the gang leader, so to speak. He's this terrorist, if you like. He's been arrested along with his henchmen, and they're sitting on death row. They're awaiting execution, and that execution is going to be a crucifixion. And now Jesus is brought before Pilate, and he's got to kind of wrestle with this dilemma because if you know the text well, and I was just thinking that this morning, this will be my 10th Easter at, at Rosebanks. I've been in these scriptures, and you know those Easter Thursday nights as we've, we've read those passages in the darkness and so on. Pilate says, why? What crime has he committed? And then Pilate says, I, I find this man innocent. He's done nothing wrong, nothing to deserve death. Pilate knows he's innocent, and so he comes up with this plan. Because the people and Pilate know that there's this custom at the Passover feast to release one prisoner. And he thinks, this is, uh, this is a no-brainer. I will bring Barabbas out along with Jesus. There's not a chance that this crowd is going to pick this terrorist and get him roaming back on the streets. So uh, the plan is sorted. And you know what happens. The crowd and their frenzy as they get worked up, and we know how crowds can get worked up can even happen in this place. That's why the working up always needs to be based on truth and not manipulation. But this crowd that gets worked up chooses Barabbas over Christ. They choose this, this, this murderer. They, they would rather have a, a terrorist roaming the streets free than Christ. That's the nature of human hatred, the, the hatred of the human heart towards Jesus Christ. They choose to free the one who takes the lives of others, the murderer, and choose to condemn the one who gives his life to bring life. And so they release Barabbas, and perhaps you know this, that Barabbas in the Hebrew, bar means son of, 
And Abba means father. Barabbas' name means son of the father. And that's the irony as we look at this story and we see what God is doing as he weaves these strands in history together. The people choose that the son of the father should be released. And yet Jesus, the true son of the father, takes Barabbas' place. He becomes his substitute. And as Barabbas walks free, Jesus goes to the cross in his place. A picture of Jesus going to the cross in all of our place. So turn to Luke chapter 23, as we see who Jesus meets today on the cross. Luke chapter 23, and I'm gonna read from verse 32, it's on page 84. So if you've got your pew belt, page 84 in the New Testament. So if you turn to the second half of the Bible there, the numbers begin again at the start of the New Testament, page 84, Luke chapter 23. And we're going to look at verses 32 right through to verse 43. But for now, I just want to read up until verse 38. And then we'll unpack the story as it goes. Page 84, Luke 23, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him, with Christ, to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. You know, as I prepared the sermon this week, I mean, I knew about the kind of the the imagery of Jesus being the substitute for Barabbas, but I'd never quite thought about this this way because I know the, the Roman culture, they were organized, they planned ahead, and it suddenly dawned on me that I think the reason why Jesus was on this middle cross It's because that was the cross that was meant for Barabbas. That was meant for Barabbas. And so Jesus is hung in the middle as though he's the gang leader. And where are the two henchmen that we read about that were in prison with Barabbas? They're on either side. So I think it's quite probable that those men were were Barabbas' henchmen. And here's Jesus, a criminal among criminals. That's what he's regarded as. Now these men on the left and on the right, the other gospel writers... Matthew, Mark, and John call them robbers. But robbery would not have deserved crucifixion. Robbery wasn't a serious enough crime in, in, in Rome to, to, to be worthy of this kind of death. Luke is probably closer to what they were called when he calls them criminals. But Josephus is a historian who lived at the time. And so when he uses certain Greek words in his writings, considering he lived at the time, it helps us to understand the nuance. What does this word robber mean? And Josephus wrote that Galilee was a haven for bandits who were guilty of, and then this is a quote, it's a translation, habitual malpractice, theft, robbery, and then this word rapine, which is the violent seizure of one's property. So you can get an idea that, yes, robbery was part of the crime, and that's how maybe we, we, we translate it in the English, robber, thief, but it was, it was murderous thieving. They were revolutionaries. These were political leaders. They were insurrectionists. They were terrorists of the state. And on the middle of cross hangs our Lord. Perhaps Isaiah was right when he prophesied. Hundreds of years earlier in Isaiah 53 verse 12, and I believe the whole of Isaiah 53 is a prophecy about Christ. He writes, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. There is Christ numbered with the transgressors. One, two, three, and he's numbered in our place as sin. And the Jews and the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers and the bystanders, they're all cackling over their tortured prey. They're like a pack of wild dogs who plays with their prey and they lick him to one side with mocks and insults and taunts. And then they watch him slowly gasp and convulse until eventually he's devoured by death itself. What we don't expect, however, 
is for the other dying prey on the crosses on the left and right to also join in. It's unfathomable. They will also pray. Here was a fellow sufferer in the middle and yet they had enough energy and hatred to heap insults on him as though he was different and yet they were suffering the same fate. That's how dark the human heart is, apart from God. Mocking Christ. And from the other gospel accounts, it seems like, at least at first, both of these criminals on either side heaped insults on Christ. But at some point, one of them falls silent. Luke doesn't record him heaping any abuse on Christ because something has changed in his heart. Something has happened. What would cause a heart like this, a hardened heart to change? But the other criminal continues with his mockery. And we read up to verse 38, so let's read verse 39. And I trust you've still got it open in front of you. Luke 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. What was he saying? Aren't you the Messiah? Well, then save all of us. This thief wants salvation, but without a cross. He thinks that there's an easy road to salvation. He thinks maybe God can save, God can just forgive, but God can't because God is holy, God is just. Somebody has to pay for our sin, and that somebody is man number two on the cross, the son of God, the son of man. We cannot be saved without the cross. This thief cannot fathom that Jesus is who he described himself, that he's a kernel of wheat that must fall to the ground and die. And unless that kernel of wheat dies, there cannot be a harvest. And when that seed dies, it looks to the disciples as though it's over, but it's just the beginning. He doesn't realize that Jesus can't save himself and save others. It's impossible. It's as foolish as mocking a literal Passover lamb in the Old Testament and saying, stupid little lamb, what are you doing? Save yourself and us. That lamb represents us. It cannot save itself and us. The kernel of wheat was being buried so a harvest of grace could be multiplied. And I think his mocking of Jesus is typical of so many today. Maybe you, maybe me, maybe people outside of the church, maybe we've all said this at times, I want nothing to do with God. I want nothing to do with your God because he has not saved me from this mess that we're in. Look at the human race, look at the world, look at cancer, look at suffering. You Christians don't deal with the real issues in life and I want nothing to do with your God because if there is a God, what kind of God would allow that kind of suffering? Why would he leave me in this mess and leave the world in this mess? But we fail to see what was happening on the cross as God suffered on our behalf. And the thing that I reflected on this week is that here's a criminal dying himself by crucifixion. But so deep is his hatred that he manages to hitch himself up, gasp life-giving air into his lungs, and then exhale it in mocking and taunting upon Christ, hurling abuse at him. I mean, that was the nature of the cross. It caused people to die from not being able to breathe because eventually you can't pull yourself up anymore. But he had enough strength and enough hatred to still rail on Christ right to the end. It's like those people that, that, that can't ever be serious. They've always got to make a joke of everything. Even now, he, he's trying to distract himself from the reality that he's teetering over hell. He's on the brink of death, that he has to face God. Even now, he's mocking Christ so that he doesn't have to face the true reality of his situation. Not even the nails of the cross can pierce his own hardened heart. That's how hard it is. And so I ask, is there no one on this hill who will speak up for Christ? Is there nobody in this crowd who will speak out and defend our Lord? There's no one. Until one solitary voice rings out across the hills. But who is it? Is it it a priest speaking up for Jesus? Is it one of the disciples? Is it perhaps Peter who's come back? Is it James? Is it John? Is it maybe one of the women in the crowd? Well, friends, this one lone voice that speaks up and defends Christ and his innocence is this thief, is the one thief on the cross. It's an incredible thought. The whole world is shouting, guilty, Christ, and suddenly this thief has had a change of heart and he says, Christ is innocent. And his faith is like a rock jutting out in a raging torrent of popular opinion. 
and this jutting rock stands there firm, unmoved, and yet he's the most unlikely candidate. Where are the religious leaders? Surely they can recognize the Messiah. It takes a criminal of great proportions to recognize Christ. So there's a change that's taken place in his heart. What was the turning point? Maybe he is a hardened criminal, had seen how other criminals behave. Takes one criminal to know one, so he certainly knew Christ is not like us. Maybe he'd watched Christ being led away like a lamb to the slaughter, almost willingly going. But you know what I think? I think it was the verse we read earlier. I think it was Christ's prayer. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He heard Christ pray that, and yet at that moment, the Roman soldiers were gambling for Christ's clothes. Christ was hanging naked with nothing, and yet the very little he had. These Roman soldiers were, were casting die and playing dice games for, and, and he hears Christ. He sees, and he thinks, Jesus loves his enemies. This is something I, I, I've never thought about. This is melting my heart. I mean, has anyone ever been more wronged than Christ? Christ, the most holy one, the one who's most different from us, the the one who's never experienced sin, Uh, sin is so abhorrent to him, it's like uh, the distance between you and somebody that that, that rapes a two-year-old, you can't get your head around that, there's no way to explain that, there's other kind of crimes you can get into the person and explain it, but there's some crimes you can't. So how does a holy God even understand what sin is? And yet in that moment, Christ says, Father, forgive them for they do not, do not know what they're doing. They're sinning in ig- ignorance. These men in front of me don't know who I am. Father, show them mercy. And this thief, with a melted heart, realizes that the only part of his body that is not nailed to a cross is his tongue. And he takes that tongue and he uses it to declare Christ's praise, to declare Christ's innocence, That tongue was free to honor God where now it had once cursed. And all of us, that's our story. We had a tongue that once cursed Christ. So what happened to us? What happened to me? Something happened in our hearts that changed us that we now have a tongue that comes to church to praise God's name. That's the wonder-working power of God's grace to a sinner. A sinner like him and a sinner like us. A hardened sinner is the hardest person to reach. I've engaged with people over the years. But think about this person. This criminal, I mean maybe some of you have been victims of crime and perhaps afterwards, particularly those of you that I've journeyed with that have had violent crime in your home, it's very hard to pray, Father forgive them, especially in the moment while the deed is happening and then furthermore afterwards you wrestle with, should I be praying for them? Oh no, such hard hearts, God can't change, uh, can God really change our country? Can he really do anything with crime? And we stop praying. Because we realize that such people, their consciences are seared, that they're they're bold and unafraid. They'll sin in the face of God and say, God, strike me down if you're real. They'll sin in the face of people and they'll even won't even fear the consequences. Maybe on the odd day, ah, yeah, I don't want to get crucified, but for now, who cares? It's my political cause. But God demonstrates his love in this, that anyone, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter how bad they've been, are not beyond God's grace. They're not. It's never too late. And this guy met Jesus with maybe an hour or two to go. And on the cross, as he looked at Christ, he was humbled. And his entire eternal destiny was changed. The sun was setting. He was teetering over death. But he'd been awakened to Christ. It's been said, I think it was by some of the Puritans back in the day, that true repentance is never too late but late repentance is seldom true. Let me read that again. True repentance is never too late, but late repentance is seldom true. In other words, genuine repentance is not too late while you've still got breath in your lungs this side of eternity. How dare we write off anyone whose heart is hard that we say God could never move in their life. Who are we to say that? Genuine true repentance is never too late, but late repentance, deathbed repentance is seldom genuine. Those of us that have been at people's deathbeds know that sometimes people can say things, they can pray things, they can make promises, but it may not be genuine. God alone knows their hearts. But we all know of stories of people that maybe been kind of, they were really on death's door and then suddenly they rallied and what did they do? They just went back to their old life. It wasn't genuine. 
So what guarantee do we even have this morning that this thief's faith was genuine? That his repentance and faith was true? Well, I think there's five very simple, brief things in the verses ahead. Number one, here's the first evidence. He shows deep concern that his fellow thief is still mocking Christ, and he rebukes him. Look at verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. There was a deep awareness of God growing in his heart. The Bible calls it the fear of God. And the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and the fear of God is recognizing who God is. It's not just trembling in a corner, it can sometimes be that as it starts, but it's an awe, it's a reverence, it's like the way that we would fear electricity, we don't just treat it lightly, there's a somberness about it because yeah, you don't turn God into something trivial. And so he was beginning to fear God and yet at the same time, while he's on the cross, it's almost as though he's got this heart for his friend. He's deeply concerned for the spiritual state of his friend's heart because his heart's been transformed but, he's transformed, but his friend is still cursing and he says, don't you fear God? What better person to speak to his friend than him? But number two, this penitent thief fully acknowledges his own sin. Look at verse 41. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. And look how many times there he says we. He's saying, my friend, we've been partners in crime for years. We've celebrated our sin. In fact, we've made a living off our sin. We, we've, got, we've had parties together to celebrate in our pride our identity as sinners. We've got together and celebrated it. We've blamed others. We've justified our behavior. We've excused ourselves. But we are getting what our sins deserve. That's true repentance. When you stop making excuses, when you stop doing what Adam and Eve are, and blaming one another, and you just say, this is me. Guilty as charged. And I see that in couples. She's to blame, no, he's to blame. And I often say, even if it's 20% your blame, you're still 100% responsible for your 20%. But there's such deep conviction here that like David, he says, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. And we always want to say to David, David, that's wrong. You sinned against Bathsheba and her husband. and all. He says, against you and you only have I sinned because it's as though everything else fades into insignificance and he realizes I ultimately answer to God. That's the prodigal son. I've sinned against heaven and against you, Father. No more excuses. No one to blame. Punish justly. We are getting what our sins deserve and every penitent person recognizes that any punishment they receive is what they deserve as justice from a holy God. So can I ask you fellow sinners, as we hang between earth and heaven, have you ever taken responsibility and owned all of your sin? Perhaps you haven't, because you just compared yourself to other people around you and you look like you're doing pretty great, but have you compared yourself to the innocent one on cross number two? Many have never been truly converted, they've never uh, said what the criminal said. Self-righteousness blinds them from sin and that's the reality, that the church is probably the most guilty institution for producing self-righteousness. And if you think being a Christian is being self-righteous, then you've missed the gospel. The gospel is for those that are really, really bad and the gospel is for those that are really, really good. It's for both. Because self-righteousness stops you from seeing sin. And all sin separates us from from God, but you know what makes that separation permanent? It's not the sin itself, but it's the ignorance of the sin. It's not recognizing you have a disease and never taking the cure because you think, I'm healthy, I don't need a doctor. And that's what the religious leaders thought. They thought they were doing God a favor, but they were actually putting God to death. We're so good at pretending, so good at performing, and I can remember the day when I became a Christian, having never really put foot in a church apart from being a five-year-old for maybe six months. And I remember the questions I had and the wrestling, and when I heard the gospel for the first time, I remember going home and falling to my knees in my room and saying, Justin, you need to repent of your self-righteous, goody two-shoes, I've got it all together kind of life. Because I prided myself that I wasn't like this thief, that I was doing pretty well and I was successful and, and people admired me. But I had to repent of my goodness because I compared myself against Christ and his beauty and his holiness, the only truly innocent one who ever lived. And as I read this account, I was moved to sadness that as I got into the story, I recognized his two friends, friends, 
They've done life together, they've been partners in crime, comrades, but now in death they'll go different ways. One is saved and one is not. There they are, maybe an hour to go. One will perish, one will be saved. So I believe this penitent thief had genuine repentance and faith, he showed deep concern, fully acknowledges his own sin, and then thirdly, he openly confesses Christ's innocence. Look at verse 41. He looks, says to his friend, he has to look across Christ in the middle and says to his friend, but this man has done nothing wrong. Somehow he recognizes that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Faith is looking away from sin and towards God. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Repentance is recognizing, am I really guilty before a holy God? Things that I think are small and insignificant because I'm comparing myself to people but not to God. And then faith looks away from self at Christ. I've recognized my condition, I'm drowning. Now what can I look, where's a branch that I can cling on to? What will save me? And we look to Christ. If you only look at your situation, you're gonna mope around and sin and, 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 and that's not helpful. We need to also have faith and look to Christ. And so he looked to Christ. The religious leaders and others didn't see their sins, so they didn't see Christ's innocence. They saw nothing worthy in Christ, but he saw Christ's beauty and innocence. Number four, he exercises faith in Christ's power and will to save him. He calls out and recognizes Christ can save me. He even acknowledges that Christ had a kingdom. This is an unfathomable thing. He might have been the first and only true convert at this point in history. Where are the disciples? They didn't see what this thief saw. Their hopes are dashed. They've run away. They've abandoned Christ. They saw Christ for three years and this guy has seen more in one afternoon than they saw in three years. He recognizes Christ as a kingdom. He recognizes Christ will reign, that there's life after death. And look what he says in verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Somehow he realizes that Jesus' death is not the end, it's just the beginning. It's not the end of all the messianic promises and claims, it's actually a prelude to messianic power. And then number five, he cries out in humble prayer, because that's what it is, and he asks Jesus to, to remember him. Not, Lord, remember all my good deeds, remember how I went to church, remember how I was religious, remember how I was a goody two-shoes, remember. No, just remember me, that's all he can say. What a great salvation prayer. Lord, remember me, that's all I can say. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What a beautiful prayer to, to pray. Lord, remember me. I think few dying people have ever left behind such good evidences of repentance and faith as this dying thief. And how does Jesus respond in verse 43? Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. I tell you the truth. As the old King James used to say, verily, verily, the Greek word is amen, amen. Jesus says, truly, I want you to get the certainty of this. Today you will be with me in paradise. And the thief had asked vaguely, you know, Lord, remember me whenever, I'm not sure when that'll be, but whenever it is, will you remember me? And Christ makes it immediate and focused, and he says, today, today. This very day, you will be with me. And if that's all the Lord had said, if he'd only said those words, you will be with me, he would have said words enough. Because wherever Christ is, is paradise. If you have Christ with you, that is heaven. That is paradise. That's the beauty. But Christ does add you to be with me in paradise, a restored garden of Eden. And that's the blessing. Christ is a paradise to us. And if this morning Jesus is just your get out of hell free ticket, you may not be truly saved. A false convert just says, oh hell, I just wanna avoid hell, oh heaven, yeah of course I want heaven with all the blessings. But the question I have is do you want Christ? Do you want Christ? Do you love Christ for Christ? Do you see his beauty? Is that why you want Christ or is he just some ticket to get heaven and not get hell? This true convert longs to be with Christ and Christ says today you'll be with me. It's about being with It's not like atheists say that we are just insects who have a life cycle and we've just been between two uh, points of annihilation and we've got this little fly life cycle that's there for, for barely an afternoon. Christ notices the individual. He says you have value, you're important, that that your life is more than the sum of 70, 80 years. You see, John Piper asked the critical question. 
And he says this, the critical question is this, if you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? Because where Christ is not is what is called hell. So that will not be heaven if Christ were not there. And that's the challenge to us. That searches our heart to say, what are our motives? Because there can be no paradise without a relationship with Christ. If this dying thief had approached the gates of heaven by himself, he would have been turned away, but he had a a mediator. He had, so to speak, a bouncer, if you like, uh, somebody to stand in the gap to say, yeah, come in with me, and I'll represent you as your advocate before the Father. I love you. No one but Christ can bring him in there and Christ promises you will be with me. You and I will enter paradise together today. So where was this thief? As his executioners came and they broke his legs as they did to speed up the process of death. Where was this thief as his lungs then collapsed and his body fell limp? He was with Christ in paradise. He was, as Alexander McLaren says, a new star swimming into the firmament of heaven, a new face before the throne of God, another sinner redeemed from earth. As Charles Spurgeon so beautifully says, who is this that enters the pearly gate at the same moment as the king of glory? Who's this favored companion of the redeemer? Is it some honored martyr? Martyr? Is it a faithful apostle? Is it a patriarch like Abraham? Or a prince like David? It is none of these. Behold and be amazed at sovereign grace. He that goes in at the gate of paradise with the king of glory is a thief. A thief. What grace. To be snatched from the flames at the last. To to be taken out of the lion's jaws just as death is is about to devour you. And friends, think about this. The penitent thief never joined a church never took communion, never got baptized, never went on a missions trip, never had a chance to be a door steward or operate a camera. That should show us and floor us what grace is and yet he was saved in his dying moments by grace alone through faith alone. In a single instant, 50, 60, 70 years of sin was blotted out and eternal life was planted in his soul. So now if you're anything like me, you're sitting there this morning and And if I was you, I'd be thinking, this account bothers me a bit. This is something that's a bit unsettling. It it, it bothers you. Because one of the first questions that I had when I first encountered Christianity was, really, you telling me that somebody can be a murderer, murder their whole lives, and on their deathbed they can say a little prayer and suddenly they're going to heaven. That is unfair. Do, Do we feel that unfairness? But the penitent thief exposes our faulty view of grace and it exposes self-righteousness. The point is God's love cannot be earned by anyone. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. If you could save yourself, there wouldn't have been the cross. We cannot be good enough. And instead of that being despairing, it is actually liberating because you can now say, I don't have to impress people and I don't have to impress God because I can't. This is me. You're looking at the real me, Lord. And then we look to Christ. Yes, I may be better than a murderer. I hope so. But just because I haven't broken any laws of the land and I'm not a criminal with a criminal record doesn't mean that I haven't broken the laws of heaven and that I don't stand guilty before a holy God. Remember back on the parable of the worker and the wages that we looked at last year? Those who came and worked at the 11th hour got paid the same as those who worked throughout the heat of the day, those who'd been Christians for longer, so to speak, and and the guys who'd worked longer, this is unfair, how can they get paid the same as us? They misunderstood grace, because grace is God's free, generous gift to whomsoever he wishes. And is grace not his to bestow, not dependent on how hard we've worked? But we shout unfair. Do you know that if God was really, truly fair, all of us would get hell. So maybe we should be grateful that God is not only fair and just, but he's also merciful and generous. Amen. 
And perhaps like me, it doesn't sit well with you this morning to hear that because like me, those years ago, you've misunderstood grace and you've misunderstood self-righteousness. You think that you have something to offer God. Todd Freeman writes, grace is the great equalizer that strips away our presumed privilege and entitlement. God's grace puts all recipients on an even playing field. That's hard to stomach when we've burdened ourselves with a merit system, wanting to see some extra reward or bonus for all our labors and hard work. So why even bother to obey God then? We obey God for the same reason that we should be saved by him, because we love him. I don't come to church so that God sees me. God, are you looking? Tick, 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 tick. I come because I love him. I want to honor him. I, I, I want to obey his commands because that's what pleases him, not because I'm trying to get his favor. It's like a relationship. It's, it's because God has worked this in me. The old Puritans used to say, only one alone was saved upon the cross so that none might despair, but only one that none might presume. That's beautiful. Only one alone was saved that none might despair. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be in the, the dying moments of your life. You could be in the sunset of your life. It doesn't matter what you've done or how bad you've been. You don't need to despair because if there's breath in your lungs, there is still hope. How dare we write anyone off? There is hope. So this one was saved so that we would not despair. But the Puritans also said, but only one that none might presume. Because you might be here saying, well, I'll just wait till my deathbed to turn to Christ. Let me live it up now. Are you really gonna presume upon grace while continuing to live in sin? And are you sure you'll have tomorrow to repent? Remember a few sermons ago, I told you about that girl in my youth ministry. Her last Facebook message to me was, maybe one day soon I'll come to my senses. And two weeks later, I was conducting her funeral. So we're not guaranteed. Doesn't matter if you think you're a saint or a religious leader, look to Christ and see it's your sin that put him on the cross. It was the religious leaders that their self-righteousness put Christ on the cross and here are two men in the exact same situation observing the same thing, this man and this man and yet nothing could separate them more. Every single person has to decide what they do with man number two on that middle cross and the entire world is divided between left and right. One is saved and one is not. So don't delay. The scriptures say today is the day of salvation. Today. Today do not harden your heart if you hear his voice. Friends, if there's no beauty in Christ today to keep you from sin, why do you think there'll be beauty in Christ tomorrow? Come, don't don't be a fool and just says, "I'll, I'll just wait, I've got time. Do you think you can use God to get into heaven? Tim Keller once said on a tweet, religious people find God useful, but true Christians find God beautiful. Maybe you're just using God this morning and you haven't really bowed the knee in in wonder and worship. So let me close with the story of a Japanese man by the name of Tokichi Ishii. He's a murderer and he was hanged in Tokyo back in 1918 and um, He'd been sent to prison more than 20 times. That's the kind of murderer he was and uh, he was believed to be a very, very cruel man. In fact, while he was in prison, uh, awaiting the death sentence, uh, he, he attacked a guard and to try and sort of subdue this guy, they, they gagged him and they bound him and they, they sort of hung him up so that his feet couldn't reach the ground and, and they said, well, well, we'll kind of torture him. And so defiant was his heart that even in that tortured situation, he still refused to apologize to this guard for what he had done. And just being, before being sentenced to death, Tokichi was sent a New Testament by two Canadian missionaries by the name of Miss West and Miss MacDonald. And after a visit from Miss West, he began to read the Bible. He began to read the story of Jesus' trial and execution because it related to his situation. And then he was struck by these words in the scriptures, riveted by the sentence. And it's from the passage we were in today. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And this sentence transformed his life. He wrote an autobiography, which has been translated. You can read it online. He didn't know when he was gonna die, and so he wrote this thing as fast as he could to, to just leave something behind. And this is what he wrote in his autobiography about this verse. I stopped 
I was stabbed to the heart as if by a five inch nail. What did the verse reveal to me? Shall I call it the love of the heart of Christ? Shall I call it his compassion? I do not know what to call it. I only know that with an unspeakably grateful heart I believed. And then he talks about his thought process around this and this is just some of it. He says, I argued that an ordinary man is filled with anger and hatred and every other spiteful passion on the slightest provocation. He was no doubt looking at his own life and his own reactions and seeing Christ in the face of these men gambling. He said, Jesus on the other hand prayed for his enemies at the very moment his life was being taken. Was an act like this possible for an ordinary man? I do not think so. Then we cannot but say that he was God. And Tokichi was sentenced to death And he accepted it, and these are his words, as the fair, impartial judgment of God. He sounds very much like this thief. Lord, I'm getting justly what I deserve, and rightly so, you are the judge, and this is what I deserve. And near the end, Miss West directed him towards the words in 2 Corinthians 6, the words sorrowful but always rejoicing. And they moved him deeply, and this is what he wrote. People will say that I must have a very sorrowful heart because I'm daily awaiting the execution of the death sentence. This is not the case. I feel neither sorrow nor distress nor any pain. Locked up in a prison cell six feet by nine in size, I am infinitely happier than I was in the days of my sinning when I did not know God. Day and night I am talking with Jesus Christ. Friends, you might be here this morning And you may feel that you cannot ask for the grace that God showed the Apostle Peter. You may say, Justin, I do not even dare to ask for the grace that was shown to Paul. Well then I encourage you this day, simply ask for the mercy that was shown to this dying thief. And just say, Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And on that day, that day that is soon coming for all of us, when our eyes begin to dim and we realize the shadow of death has been cast upon our lives, in that day, Christ will whisper to us if we've asked him to remember us. Today, today you will be with me in paradise.